Thank you, Member. Member for Vancouver, Port Grey. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. I'm, uh, I'm glad to see there's a good crowd in the gallery for this debate. This is a very important discussion about the future of farmland in our province, about where we're going to get our food from uh, in the future and making sure that we have food security because I'm sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that everybody in the gallery knows uh, that we're looking at climate change and in California, very serious droughts threatening food security. Food prices are going up, the price of meat is going up, the price of fish is going up, the price of vegetables are going up. And we're all seeing that at the grocery store. And what we're seeing is the impact of a loss of farmland and climate change that's threatening crops. And so that's what our debate is about today here, Mr. Speaker. That's the context that we're working in. But it's, it's also a political issue as well, obviously. We're here in the legislature. And today was the birthday, actually, of a guy named Harold Steves, who uh, not everybody will know. Um, but uh, he's a very important figure in terms of the people who got together and said, we need to have protections in place to make sure that farmland is available for generations to come uh, in our province. And Harold Steves came from Richmond. He was a cattle farmer. His family were cattle farmers. Um, and, uh, and when he was in this legislature, he was a strong advocate for farmland and, and helped put together this agricultural land reserve, which is just what it sounds like. It's a reserve for agricultural land. It says that this land is held to make sure that it's here for future generations. And so why are we having this discussion about changing the agricultural land reserve? Why are you hearing all of these speeches from this side of the legislature? And this side of the legislature is the opposition, right? We're the opposition, and that side of the legislature is the government. Why is nobody on the government side standing up to defend these proposals? Why are you only hearing from the opposition? It's because the government is, they don't see any point in discussing this. They haven't consulted about these proposals. They haven't gone out into the community to talk about it. They're just putting it through. And they won't even stand up to defend uh, what they're doing here in terms of the agricultural land reserve. So all you're going to hear is one side of the debate, unfortunately, today. But fortunately, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have communications from the government that sets out why they're doing this. And the official reason, um, the member for Kootenai East, um, we have to refer to people by where they're from rather than using their name in the legislature. He sent an email. Um, to the Agricultural Land Reserve, expressing his concern about the fact that there are people in his constituency that would like to take land out of the Agricultural Land Reserve, that lands that are not suitable for agriculture. And so in this email, he talks about the importance of, of redefining the boundaries of the Agricultural Land Reserve. He says in this email, which is a very formal email, quote, no one up here is trying to undercut the ALR. We just want what we were promised when the ALR was first created, a boundary review to ensure land within the reserve is actually worth protecting for agriculture. Well, that sounds eminently reasonable, Mr. Speaker. If there are lands that aren't appropriate for agriculture, then why would they be in the agriculture land re uh, reserve? And the head of the Ag Agricultural Land Commission uh, wrote a report and sent it to the government in, in response to this very concern. And he said, I have previously written to you in detail about the boundary review process. In the Elk Valley alone, we're proposing to exclude approximately 1,400 hectares from the ALR based on our findings that the identified lands are unsuitable for agricultural pursuits. Now, those lands are exactly in the constituency of the member for Kootenai East. And so that's 1,400 hectares already taken out of the agricultural land reserve. The agricultural land Commission plans to continue targeted ALR boundary reviews in the Kootenai, Interior and North regions to ensure only those lands that are both capable and suitable for agriculture are in the ALR. Well, Mr. Speaker, that's under the existing law. Currently, the Commission's reviewing. They're looking at this land. They're saying if it's not suitable for agriculture, then we're going to pull it out. It's happening, exactly what uh, now the Minister for Core Review asked for. But Mr. Speaker, what this is really about is not about a boundary review. This is about making it easier to use agricultural land for development purposes that are not growing food, to take uh, land out of the reserve and use it for other purposes. And the reason why we know that is because we have an email from the former Minister of Agriculture, the member for Peace River North, who wrote back. And I guess he didn't understand uh, who he was writing to when he wrote back his very frank feelings about what this was actually all about. But he says he's clearly frustrated. 
quote, all we have seen from the ALC is a complete stall. They are not even considering meeting with our board until September or later. And every time I try to contact Mr. Bullock, that's the head of the Agricultural Land Commission, I am told that he is an arm's length body and for me to get the hell out of his hair. Who the hell is running our province anyways? Here is an opportunity to actually muster up some support for our team, but instead we will ignore it and go out and find some way to give the Indians more money, which doesn't get me one vote. I am getting very tired of this kind of nonsense. Well, speaking of nonsense, Mr. Speaker, speaking of nonsense, speaking of racist nonsense. So what this email tells us is that the, the former Minister for Agriculture, the member for Peace River North, he's not concerned about the boundaries. He's just concerned that he isn't the guy that gets to say, okay, pull this land out of the agricultural land reserve. Pull this land out of the agricultural land reserve. I'd like to be the guy. I'm tired of this arm's length commission telling me to stay out of their hair. I'm sick of that. Who the hell is running this province? I'm running the province. I got elected. Well, the, the reason why the commission exists is to avoid this kind of political interference in something really important, to have an arm's length commission that looks at the province as a whole and makes decisions about where the land is going to go. And so it's, it's very useful to have this email and to have this context for what this is really all about. It's not about boundaries. We get it now. And if there was one person in the province that you would think would be the expert in whether the proposals put forward by the government to change this law that protects agricultural land were going to work, whether they were going to be effective or not, it would be the head of the Agricultural Land Commission. And in fact, in December, the head of the Agricultural Land Commission wrote to the government and said, hey, thanks for letting me know about your proposals to change the law. Here are my thoughts about what you're suggesting to put forward. And it's a, it's a very polite letter. You know, it says some, it says, thanks, you know, these are challenges that we face. You recognize, we recognize the challenges that we face. But I have some concerns about what you're putting forward in this proposal. First of all, the, this, this change to the law proposes putting in place six different regional panels instead of one central provincial panel, which is the way the commission's been uh, operating. So first of all, he says, you know, if you're going to be running this way, it's going to be very expensive. If you're going to run all these separate regional panels that are going to make these decisions, it's going to be very inefficient. He says that one of the reasons why the commission works well is that he's able to send people out across the province to visit sites, and he doesn't have to maintain people and salaries in each region of the province. He can send them out as they're needed, as a task force. In addition, the, the benefit that he sets out of, of having a central provincial commission rather than six separate regional ones is that decisions can be made in the best interest of the province. And, and he says here his concern about regional panels. He says, I realize there are some who would take the view that the Agricultural Land Commission, this is a body that makes decisions about whether or not land can come out of the commission, it would make better decisions if fully regionalized panels made the decision for a particular region. The difficulty I have found with those taking this view, which in my experience is a small but vocal minority, is that they usually equate better decision making with decisions removing land from the ALR. I have not yet heard it argued that regional panels are necessary to better preserve agricultural land. Critics rarely mention the substantial number of applications to pull land out of the reserve that have been approved. These successful applicants obviously do not complain, although it, it is noted that the Agricultural Land Commission is often criticized on the other side for granting these very approvals. This is the turf on which an independent administrative tribunal must necessarily operate. We can rarely make everybody happy. Given that reality, an honest question has to arise as to whether institutionalizing regional decision making will actually improve things. So here's someone who's actually worked with regional panels He's had regional panels before, and he has reduced the cost of operating this administrative tribunal by centralizing that, and also, he says, delivered good decisions, provincial decisions about what's best for agriculture, and yet this government knows better. 
This government says, no, we're going to go to the regional panels anyway. Uh, we're not too interested in your feedback on that. He also goes into detail about, and this is the most important part, the government's proposal will split the province into two separate sections, zone one and zone two, and the protections for agricultural land will be different for the two different zones. And here again, the expert, this is the guy who sees applications every day from people who want to take land out of the agricultural land reserve and use, these, use the land for other purposes. Now, the government will tell you, well, zone two, the land's not as good in zone two. That's why we have fewer protections in zone two. The land's not as good. Zone one is the really good agricultural land, and zone two is kind of not as good, so it doesn't need as many protections. Here's what the expert says. I have heard the view expressed by some that ALR land in what you describe as zone two is of lesser agricultural importance. It is not always appreciated that each and every region of BC has prime agricultural land based on agricultural capability classifications and agriculturally suitable lands for specialty crops, forage, extensive agricultural uses, and non-soil bound agricultural endeavors. He says, the best policy is based on reality, not on, not on sort of rhetoric that zone, zone one is the bad land and zone, two, zone one is the good land and zone two is the bad land. The best policy is based on reality. And he crunches the numbers and he says, this data shows it is not correct to suggest that the Kootenays, the North, and the Interior possess, as regions, lesser agricultural lands. In reality, the large majority of good agricultural lands in BC are in these regions. So here's the expert saying the large majority of good agricultural lands in BC are in the exact regions where the government is proposing to reduce the protections for agricultural land. And he also notes the trends, right? The obvious trends that we all see that land is getting more expensive in the south, that more people are living in. Uh, the Metro Vancouver area and Zone 1 areas, and that the price of land is going up, there's increased speculation, and there's increased pressure on the agricultural land reserve to pull land out for things like subdivisions, for various, uh, for various uses. And because the cost of land is going up, if you want to get into farming, it makes sense that people are going to start looking north. And so he's saying what the agricultural land reserve has been doing is been doing a good job of protecting land in the north where it lands a little bit cheaper, if you want to get into farming, you're going to be able to get into it. It, it. it isn't something that they've just made up. They've thought very carefully about the future of the province and the future of agricultural land. He says, it is understood that the majority of BC's population growth will continue in the southwest. Pressures to convert agricultural land to accommodate urban growth will continue, as will the pressures on farmers to change or stop certain agricultural practices. I took a, an agricultural law course um, in my undergrad, uh, and uh, the prof uh, at the front of the room asked, are there any farmers in the room? And uh, a couple people put up their hands, and he said, well, what is the worst kind of neighbor for a farmer to have? And they said, well, easy, city people, right? And, there, and that was a shock to me as a city person, because I thought he'd be a pretty good neighbor. But the issue is that a lot of farm practices are loud, they're smelly, they're noisy, and so when you have a residential population living beside a farm, there's a lot of pressure on farmer, farmers to change their practices so they stop uh, doing things that bother people in the homes that live right next to the agricultural land. So as urban growth continues, there'll be, there'll be more and more pressure on farmers. So he says, I envision that appropriately transferable agricultural enterprises may look northward, but they will only do that if the opportunity exists, that is, if the land is there. Now is the time to consider the potential future agricultural role of Northeast BC. Also, it is timely to consider the potential economic opportunities for agriculture in the years ahead, given this huge land base and its proximity to northern transportation routes to Asia. You might think to yourself, gosh, Asia, that seems really far away. Why would we be um, exporting food? Because it seems like we import a lot of food from Asia right now. But there's a larger global context that's taking place right now around food as well. There's something which, uh, uh, honorable speaker, which those in the gallery and those watching at home and the members opposite may not have heard of, but there's a global phenomenon taking place right now, something called land grabbing. 
And what that is, is it's large investment companies buying up large amounts of land, agricultural land around the world, in order to grow crops on it, especially for biofuels. And so it's driving up the cost of the land, and the land is being used not to grow food, but being used to grow fuel. There's a professor at UNBC in Prince George that's done a lot of work on this, and he emailed me when I asked him uh, for some details. He said, there's between 150 and 200 million hectares of land around the world acquired by corporations, institutional investors, and governments, or their sovereign wealth funds, since 2006, and those figures come from the World Bank and Oxfam. World food prices, during the world food cri uh, global food crisis of 2007, 2008, wheat prices doubled and rice prices tripled. And so when you're looking at a global context like that, where people are grabbing up land because as investments, because they recognize the huge future value of these lands, why is BC at that exact moment weakening our protections for agricultural land and weakening what the head of the Agricultural Land Commission has identified as a potential opportunity for export to countries in Asia to respond to that crisis, especially in, in light of climate change. Now, there's another reason that the, the head of the Agricultural Land Commission sets out to say, please don't divide the province into two different zones. Please don't do this. The other reason is that it creates a division and an unnecessary division between farmers. It says, quote, it's not difficult to anticipate the equity arguments that will be made by those in the have-not region who feel they were excluded from the rights, quote unquote, given to others whose land is not qualitatively different. This is another reason for dealing with unsuitable, quote unquote, agricultural land directly by way of boundary reviews throughout the province. To balkanize the land reserve is unlikely to create more harmony among farmers and ranchers. What he's saying here is this is going to create a race to the bottom. If you reduce the protections in zone one, or in zone two, and zone one has higher protections, and I'm a farmer in zone one who would like to sell my land to someone, but I can't because the people who want to buy it want to use it for development, they say, well, why are you treating me differently than the, than the guys in zone two? This isn't fair. And so the government will be under a great deal of pressure to change the rules for zone one as well so that they match, so that it's fair treatment for all farmers across the province. And then you'll have the discussion again with zone two where they'll say, oh, well, I thought our land was less valuable, so if those are the protections in zone one, well, we need slightly lesser protections, and before you know it, uh, we're in a race to the bottom. And uh, this bill is going to take us a long way there. The last piece that, that the head of the Agricultural Land Commission expresses concern about are the, there's a set of conditions that the Agricultural Land Commission must consider in deciding whether or not land comes out of the reserve or stays in the reserve. And these are the, these are the rules that'll be different between zone one and zone two. And he says that the reduced restrictions in zone two that'll make it easier to pull the land out are problematic. And, and here's why. I expect you would agree that at this very important moment in time, the Agricultural Land Commission should be encouraged in its efforts to strive for decision making that is more consistent, more predictable, and more transparent. However, if these new factors are added to the Agricultural Land Commission Act, I anticipate, over and above concerns related to the preservation of agricultural land, allegations of inconsistent decision making will be magnified, particularly if combined with a regional panel structure. It is easy to foresee critics arguing that while regional panel decision making may properly take regional differences into account, decision making should be consistent across the province on matters where regional differences are irrelevant. So he says, you've got these new factors that require interpretation. You're dividing the province up into six parts. Each of these six parts of the province are going to be making different decisions. And so it's just a matter of time before on the cover of the province, on the cover of the Vancouver Sun, you see one farm that gets approval to be removed from the Agricultural Land Commission. And right beside it, another farm looks identical, the exact same kind of land, the same kind of operation, doesn't get approval. And it will discredit the Agricultural Land Commission. But more than that, 
it will cause speculation. So if I'm a developer and I'd like to build a rodeo or an RV park or whatever the proposal is, you've probably heard all kinds of them in the media, and I'd like to do that, maybe I'll take a chance on buying agricultural land, reserve land, because maybe I'll be able to make the case now under these new reduced rules that I'll be able to take that land out of the Agri Agricultural Land Commission, or out of the Agricultural Land Reserve. And this speculation drives up the cost of farmland, making it more and more difficult for young farmers to get into this industry. Because every young farmer needs just one thing to get started, and that's land. I think probably, though, the most important part of the letter from the Agricultural Land Commission head, his name is Richard Bullock, the most important part of this letter is his conclusion. And the reason the, the conclusion is so important is because he says, look, there's probably ways, no, he says there are definitely ways that we can improve the legislation. But the only way that that can happen is with in-depth consultation and discussion with stakeholders. And the Honorable Speaker, the people in the gallery may not know this, but this government actually does know how to do consultation. On the, on the Water Act reforms, the government spent two years going across the province. They set up a website where people could file submissions. They made amendments and changes. They had discussion papers. They had industry and environmental groups and community members coming together and sharing their feedback. And at the end of the day, everybody, in, it wasn't perfect legislation, but everybody in this legislature stood to support that bill. And we all voted together in favor of that bill. And that was because of the consultation that was done. When it came to the apology that we made just the other day to the Chinese community for the head tax, for the racist laws that were passed in this legislature, the government went out, the opposition went out, and we met with groups and we talked with people what will make a meaningful apology, what, what exactly should be in this apology? What are the pieces that you're going to be looking for in order to be satisfied? And everybody worked together in this house to make that happen. These things can happen, and they do happen. And so here you have the Agricultural Land Reserve, which has been around for 40 years. All parties, I mean, this has survived parties, Social Credit, BC Liberal, NDP, who have all supported the Agricultural Land Reserve. And now the government would like to change it. Surely, surely there is time after 40 years to take the necessary time to consult, but that is not happening. Mr. Bullock had just one final point. I'm going to read from his letter because it's really important to know what the head of the commission right now says will work best. I will make just one final point, which is about the importance of in-depth consultation and discussion with stakeholders. As you know, Recent media reports have revealed serious concern with regard to the consultation issue. I know from my own experience that consultation is critical, both to ensuring change is both well-informed and accepted. To this end, my experience is that key stakeholders include local governments, the Union of BC Municipalities, the BC Agriculture Council, the BC Cattlemen's Association, who are here today in the legislature, the BC Fruit Growers Association, and the BC Food Systems Network, to name a few. As you reflect on this letter and in your own thinking regarding these issues, we also invite you to consult with the Agricultural Land Commission, as we do have considerable experience, expertise, and data, which we believe can only assist in the policy process. This man sat down and wrote an 11-page thoughtful letter about the government's proposal, concluding Please go out and consult. And yet, when we had a motion here on consultation, the government voted against it. And not only that, at the end of the day today, they have already passed a motion that invokes something called closure, which is the end of debate on this, that they're going to shut it down no matter where we are in the process, and they're going to pass everything at once. And if you stick around, you'll see it, but I don't blame you if you don't, because it will be a sad moment. When you look at uh, the suggestion from the Agricultural Land Commission about who should be consulted, the Union of BC Municipalities, they said they've reviewed the exec legislative amendments. They said they're looking for future consultation with the province on this matter. Hasn't happened. I could, I, 
I don't see much point in going through the whole list, but there is a whole list of organizations that have been seeking consultation with the government because they have suggestions and feedback on how to improve this law, and the government's not going to do that consultation. So I won't waste anybody's time with that. Honorable Speaker, I'll, I'll say to you and, and to the members opposite and to the people in the gallery, as an MLA, we get letters, we get emails from people. It is a, it is a strange, uh, it is an unusual situation to get, as an opposition MLA, 267 emails on, a, on an issue. But I got 267 emails on this agricultural land reserve issue. 267 people took time out of their day to pay attention to a relatively obscure, and I see the Minister of Agriculture, I'm sure he's received many, many times uh, that number of emails, took time out of their day to express concern about these proposals. I'm, I'm gravely concerned by Bill 24. This bill proposes fundamental changes to the ALR that could result in the permanent loss of protected BC farmland. Stephen Phillips. Dear Mr. Eby, I recently received an email regarding Bill 24. Coincidentally, the very day I read this email, I'd been on a transit bus from the Tawasan Ferry heading home to Vancouver from a weekend on the Gulf Islands. In passing, I looked at the fields and guessed as to what they might be growing and realized what a privilege it was to live in a city that had farmlands not too far away and that at least some of our food could be locally produced. From what I understand, Bill 24 would allow the destruction of farmlands in a different area of our province to allow for construction. That seems so wrong. Linda Campbell, P.S. My reluctance in the past to write to any member of parliament or politician has been the feeling that it would fall on deaf ears. Hopefully, with the hopeful addition of, of many other people also concerned, this may be of some good. One of the, uh, the biggest concerns, honorable speaker, and one of the biggest reasons why I'm standing to support this amendment is the growth in the local food industry across the province and the, the threat to uh, that economic, that new industry that's, that's growing up in uh, British Columbia. So, Honourable Speaker, I don't know about, uh, about you and the members opposite and the people in the gallery, if you've been to a farmer's market lately, but if you, if you have, uh, you wouldn't be alone. Um, there are startling statistics about the growth of farmers market in Vancouver alone. Uh, total vendor sales are $7.1 million. The total economic benefit to the economy, $14 million. But it's not just Vancouver, it's across the province. 33 markets across the province. I went to an amazing farmers market, Honorable Speaker, in Terrace, BC. In, the, in this article in the Vancouver Sun, which came out in July, they did a survey of almost 10,000 people at 33 farmers markets across the province. The manager of the Squamish market, talks about the explosion of interest in local food and how much people are seeking out food that's grown in their community by local farmers on BC agricultural land. Quote, I started managing this market six years ago and it was very small and simple, maybe 12 vendors. Now we're full with 62 vendors and we have a waiting list. There's a lot more quality and a lot more local support for independent business ventures. Now this survey said that across BC, the economic benefits of all farmers markets in BC in 2012, it was two years ago, was greater than $170 million. That's a 147% increase from a similar study done just six years before that. There's been a 62% increase in the number of farmers markets across the province. The Squamish market uh, is responsible for $1.8 million in economic activity in that community. And the growth has been huge. In, the, in this survey, 9,800 people, 20% it was their first time going to a farmer's market. So I think, and it, it just, to, just to finish this thought off, the, the, the one threat that was identified, the single threat that was identified to this remarkable growth in, the, in, a, in this industry in British Columbia has been the fear of uh, a lack of farmers and a lack of, of vendors. And the author of the study said, quote, as demand for local food increases, it places more importance on the protection of the agricultural land base. And yet, at this exact moment, 
that there's more importance on the protection of the agricultural land base, Mr. Speaker. That is the moment that we are choosing to reduce the protections for the agricultural land base in British Columbia. I'm just going to see the green light, which uh, means that I've got just a, a minute or so left. Actually, zero seconds. Yeah, no, I've got zero seconds left. Mr. Speaker, I have so much to say about this. I thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you, Member.